Okay, I'm not going to ask you to open your Bibles this morning like I always do because I'm going to put everything up here, but I have a different message this morning. I want to share a true testimony of something that's happening right now. Everyone, everyone here knows that I was a Baptist preacher for many years, and uh, then one day I saw the truth of the Word of God rightly divided, and I stopped mixing law with grace. And it completely helped us understand who we are in Christ. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of great teachings in the Baptist church. But so for me to talk about the Baptist church is not, you know, I'm not speaking from a, a position of ignorance. I was there. I know why they teach what they teach. I know where they get their teachings. I know what they teach. I was there. I was a Baptist preacher, okay, for many years. So I'm not pe preaching or talking from a position of ignorance. But I want to talk to you today about what happens when someone who's been t attending a church for a long time decides to leave. I would say, just from my own personal experience, that for the past 15, 20 years, 99% of the people who leave a church in America and across the world are leaving Baptist churches. I mean, that's just, that's just a fact of life. And they leave when they find out that their pastors are mixing law and grace, and their eyes are open to that. I had a Baptist preacher call me three weeks ago. He could not believe that people were leaving his church to join us, to join, our, to join in with us and with our understanding. And when he called me, he was pretty cold. Um, the, first thing, the first words out of his mouth was, do you have articles of faith? And I said, yes, we do. And he said, well, where are they? I said, well, they're on our website. He says, you mean those 11 things you have? Because he was sitting at his computer and he, he was on our website. He says, those, that, you only have 11? I said, yes, sir, that's what we believe. And then I told him, I says, we believe in salvation by grace through faith, in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, that salvation is a free gift, and that when a person is saved, they're saved eternally. They become a member of the body of Christ. We preach the pre-tribulation rapture of the church. We preach that at the end of the tribulation, Jesus Christ returns and destroys the armies of the Antichrist. Then, then there's the thousand-year reign of Christ where he sits on his throne. And then at the end of that is the great white throne judgment. And then Revelation 21.1, I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away. And then Ephesians 1.10, in the fullness of times, we go out into eternity. He said, after, after I said all those things, he said, did you grow up in a Baptist home? I said, no, sir, I grew up in a Catholic home. And he said, that's amazing, because everything you just said is Baptist doctrine. And I, I kind of chuckled, and I said, no, it's not. It's Bible doctrine. <laughs> you know what I mean? This is in the Bible. Has, this has nothing to do with any denomination whatsoever. And so he repeated in, in our conversation that there's a couple that was leaving his church, but he asked me, he didn't ask me, when he, re, when he retold this story in his church, because I've been listening to his sermons because I want to hear what he's been saying. He told his people that he asked me if I had been excommunicated from a Baptist church, which he had never, he didn't ask me that. And I'm, I'm realizing that this guy is, you'll know a little bit more about him in a moment. This is why I'm sharing this. You'll, you'll hear more about it, but he was really trying to discredit me and really make me look like a heretic and an evil person preying on churches, you know, trying to steal people from their churches. So he absolutely never asked me 
if I had been excommunicated from a Baptist church. So the bottom line is we talked for like an hour. And at the end of the conversation, because I had explained to him the, the doctrines of grace and rightly dividing the word of truth, at the end of our conversation, he said, well, you know what? You've said some very interesting things and you're making me think. And I thought, okay, well, that's good. So during our conversation, he told me about these people that were leaving his church and as their shepherd, he was going to do everything he could to stop that from happening. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. I can understand that. I, I don't like to see people leaving their churches. I think that's a sad thing. Anytime that that happens, and for a lot of people, it can be a very painful thing. Not just for the ones leaving, but for the ones that they are, they're leaving. I mean... I received an email one day from the adult biblical doctrines class at Farmington Ave, Baptist. And he sent me an email and he said, I've been watching some of your videos and I'm starting to understand right division and I'm teaching the Sunday school class here. What should I do? Do you remember that? Yeah, well, that was the first email you ever sent me. That was the first email you sent me. And I said, just keep teaching your Sunday school class. That's what I told. I didn't say you should leave your church. You should do. I said, keep serving the Lord where you are. And then I never heard from him again for like six months. During the, that time, I did not email him and say, how's it going? Here's what you should be saying. I didn't do that. I let the Lord take care of these things. You know, I'm not in control of this stuff. Then one day, six months later, he contacts me again and he says, well, the, could you come over to our house and meet me and my wife and my family? You remember that? And I went over to his house and we talked. And even then, I didn't say, you need to leave your church and you need to come to our church. I didn't say, I don't say that to people. There's not a person in here. There's not one person who's ever been here. There's quite a few people missing today. But there's no one has ever heard me try to bring them from where they are to come to anywhere near where I am. Ever, ever, ever. So he's telling me about these people who are wanting to leave his church. What he didn't know is they had emailed me also. And again, I did the same thing to them. I didn't encourage what was going on. I mean, they sent me an email asking for material, asking for our timeline. I sent it to them, and that was it. And I had only contacted, had only spoke to them in that email. But eventually, a few days later, they wanted to talk on the phone. And so we communicated, and we've had several con conversations and what I came to learn is that they are the nicest most loving most caring most gentle people just like you folks just like you folks okay and they told me what happened they told me how that they prayed about what they were going through spiritually and you know they had they had contacted the pastor they had sent him an, a text or an email or however they contacted him saying, we're going through something spiritual right now. We'd like to step down from our positions. They were serving in that church for 16 years. And we'd like to do it quietly. She showed me, she showed me what she sent him. So we'd like to do it quietly. Please, she said, please respect our request which was the, absolutely the perfect and the right thing to do. Because listen, leaving a church that you have been at for many, many years is not easy. I mean, like I, you know, like I told Don, and like I know, it's a, it's a struggle to leave a church because you know so many people, you love them, they love you, your wife has close relationships with people that have... There's a bond that has formed over the years, and 
now all of a sudden you have a better understanding of the scripture and they don't understand why you would leave. But the transition for some people is tumultuous, but it wasn't tumultuous for you guys. I mean, you were not told not to teach, uh, not to contact other people and not to... You, you, you folks leaving, you, I'm talking about you and Kathy, was, you know, you probably never really heard from your pastor again after you left, right? I mean, it was like, that was it. it okay, you guys are going, you're going, all right. But when some people finally leave the church that they've been attending for years because they come to the truth, if their pastor was a controlling, manipulating pastor who disguises his manipulation under the guise of being a, a good shepherd of the sheep who supposedly is watching over your souls and his messages usually include leadership principles that reinforce his authority over the flock and lends credibility to them falling down and adoring submission to his authority. Well, this couple, who obviously I'm not going to mention, they ran across some of, our, some of my videos on YouTube by accident. And that pastor, their pastor, is now telling his people that because of this COVID thing, he knows, we, he says, we know, and he's talking about me, we know that people are sitting at their computers and I, guys like me, are reaching into their churches to try to draw their people away. I'm like, where is he getting this? I mean, how do you arrive at, how do you arrive at that and lure them away from their church, local churches? How many of you here were lured away from where you were by this pastor? No hands. No hands at all. Yeah, yeah, right. Sure you were, Sal. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you started talking about it. yeah, you remember the day at the pizza place where I told you, get away from me, I don't want to talk to you anymore? Yeah, you told me that too. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. I said, I'm withdrawing fellowship from you. That's what I told Sal. But anyway, his husband is the one who ran into my videos, right? And he started watching them. And then his wife, huh? Her husband. Did I say his? I said his husband. Yeah. Her husband. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Thank you for correcting that. Thank you for correcting that. Her husband ran across the video, my video, and he started watching. She came home one day, and he said, I have something to tell you, and you're not going to like it. And she goes, she said, what? And he asked her to watch some videos with her. And guess what? She saw the truth. She saw rightly dividing the word of truth, that not everything in the Bible is written to me. You know, like, that's how I preached. As a Baptist preacher, that's how I preached. I took you everywhere, and I made it all apply somehow, you know, and forced law into there somehow, which can be very confusing. And then... After she was watching some of these with him, she, she looked at him and she said, you're not thinking of leaving our church, are you? To which he answered, being of sound mind and having sat under that pastor's teaching for 16 years, he said to her, I can't go back. And that's shocking. That's shocking for the wife. So they began listening to the word of God, rightly divided. And as they were watching, they, became, they, they realized that their pastor, for the most part, had been keeping them in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And they realized that he was keeping them under the law. 
They also realized that he didn't know the difference between law and grace and that he was trying to keep the whole church under both law and grace at the same time. Now, these absolutely wonderful, friendly, loving people who were involved, she was the Sunday school teacher, just like Mrs., uh, what was her name? Schwanky. Mrs. Schwanky at Emmanuel. She was the most loved Sunday school teacher in that place. I don't know if you ever knew, you knew Ms. Schwanky. Uh, she was unbelievable. Okay. Well, this, this woman, same thing. This was not something easy, okay, for them to do. Then one day they arrived at a, a fork in the road or or I should say uh, they arrived at the place in their lives where they had to make this incredible decision. And you need to understand, these are not the kind of people who wanted to create strife. They're not the kind of people who want to hurt anyone's feelings. They don't want anyone to be upset with them. They're not trying to create division. They're not trying to create a church split. Or they just want to leave silently. That's all they want to do, okay? That was their request because they're seeing something in the Word of God that is finally making sense to them. So they decide to make the most difficult decision in their lives. They decide to tell the pastor that they need to step down from their ministries while they seek the Lord. And, and they showed me what they sent him. And I'm telling you, he should have listened. He should have, he should have obeyed their request that they just wanted to leave silently because they're not running around the church trying to drag people away with them. That is not what these people, these are, I'm telling you, I've talked to them many times now. These are wonderful, caring, sensitive to the needs of others kind of people. So after they tell him this, they go home and they start getting texts from the pastor that he wants to come over with a couple of deacons and discuss this with them. Well, they absolutely don't want to talk this over with him because they know how he is. He's an overbearing man. And then he contacts them one day and he contacts her and he texts her and insists that he comes over with the deacons. She calls her husband at work, says, did you get the text also? He said, yes. The husband, got on, the husband tells the pastor, just remove us from the membership. And throughout all these discussions that they were having, this pastor kept threatening that if you leave, I'm announcing it from the pulpit on Sunday morning, and everybody's going to know that they can't have any fellowship with you, and they need to stay away from you people, and threats after threats like that. Pardon? That's wicked. Yeah, that's wicked. So here's what really sticks out to me about a man like that, okay? He talked for years. He talked about being a loving shepherd. He's really concerned about the spiritual well-being of his flock. I want to interject something here, okay? Over the years in our ministry, there have been times when there were several people who left our church. Matter of fact, there's one time when a lady took her mother and her brother and her best friend. Huh? And her father. And her father out of this ministry. And when she left, she sent an email to every single people. There was a lot more people. We used to have a lot more people, remember? Mm -hmm. And she sent an email to every single person telling them how much of a no good pastor I was and all sorts of things like that. And all kinds of complaints. Not just one email, several emails. And then Somebody from our church sent me, all, sent me those emails. Do you know that not one person in our assembly ever heard about that 
from this pulpit. Ever. Not one time. Every one of you know that you've never heard me say about one person who left our church that none of you were ever to communicate with that person if she contacted you, that you were not to talk to her, that you were to shun her, or that you were to unfriend her if she was your friend online. None of you have ever heard anything like that come from this pulpit. Don't talk to them because they no longer agree with this doctrine or whatever. None of you have ever heard that from me. You want to know why? Because when people leave, I absolutely know this. They are someone else's property. They belong to the Lord. They are the Lord's own personal possession, not mine. He purchased them with his own blood. And God forbid that I would do anything to someone who doesn't belong to me, especially do something evil to someone who does not belong to me. Here's what I know. I have a man in the Word of God who is my pattern. He's my pattern. And I'm going to share a few verses with you. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 5 Paul, the Apostle Paul said, For neither at any time used we flattering words, as ye know, nor a cloak of covetousness, God is witness. Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, nor yet of others, when we might have been burdensome as the apostles of Christ. Notice, but we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her children. Even as a nurse cherisheth her children. And then he ends this important section with verse 11. As ye know how we exhorted and comforted and charged every one of you as a father doth his children. How does a nurse cherish her children and a father his own children? How does he do that? He does it with care and with concern and with comfort. And the nurse and a father wouldn't do anything to harm their own children, right? Even if they leave, Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Alexander the coppersmith did me much harm. What did Paul say? Lord, have mercy on him. He didn't attack him. He didn't do anything like that. A nurse and a father would never harm their own children. I would never think of harming the people who left here. Am I not the pastor? who has told people over the years, over and over and over and over again, that is, if, if there's anything I will be known for in my life, is that I have been a helper of your joy. For 2 Corinthians 1.24, Not for that we have dominion over your faith, but are helpers of your joy. For by faith ye stand. Does anyone think that it's my responsibility to dominate? To dominate and control your life as a believer in Christ? Or am I and every other pastor in the world supposed to be a helper of your joy and cherish you and nurture you as a nurse and a father cherish their children? That's why when people have left here in the past... And even though they wanted to create problems and cause divisions, and even though they wanted to create a church split, I did nothing against those people. I did nothing against those people. On the contrary, I prayed for them. I prayed that they would find a place where they could be blessed, where they could be a blessing, and where they could find the peace of God and enjoy their life in Christ. 
That's what I prayed for them. And I can tell you that I was sad when they left. But the thought of retaliation against them never crossed my mind. I'm just not a vindictive kind of man. I don't believe in that. I believe in forgiveness and forgiving. That's what I believe in. And again, I never told anyone of the people in our church, I never told any one of you not to talk to them or stay away from them or any such evil and despicable and ungodly thing. Am I right? Yeah, that's right. But there are some men who call themselves shepherds today who when people do leave their churches, they turn on them. You know, as long as you're a good little follower and you do what you're told, you're okay. But you just dare walk away from here and you see what's going to happen to you. And what do those men do? They lash out against people that Jesus Christ died for and they treat, treat the Lord's heritage like demons and they spiritually kick them and call them names and scare the other sheep in the assembly and lie about the people who left and make false accusations against them and why do they do that because their pride was hurt their little ego has been bruised and now they're insulted that people are leaving their teachings for what they call cultish teachings and heresies and call people like me, someone like me, who exalts the Lord Jesus Christ and presents salvation as a free gift that you cannot earn, that you don't deserve, that you cannot pay for, Someone like me who is a helper of your joy and helps you understand who you are in Christ and the peace you have with God because you've been forgiven all trespasses and he calls those people who left and me heretics. Heretics. But here's the truth. When someone leaves a church like that, you find out that the shepherd who told you that he loved you and cared for your souls now wants to destroy you. And that little sheep that followed his teaching was a good little sheep, but when his doctrine, when that pastor's doctrine is brought into question, you find out that that shepherd is really a spiritual gangster. Leaving his church, leaving his little organization, is like leaving the mob. You leave the mob, you die. You get kicked, you get beaten, you get insulted, you get mocked, and basically you're just a stupid little sheep because you stopped listening to the man. You know that man sent a text to every person in that church warning them about this beautiful couple and ruined almost every relationship that they had. He didn't ruin all of them. Her Sunday school children who loved her with all their hearts were warned against these people. Can you imagine that? I can't. Do you know the truest test of a shepherd is when someone leaves your church. I mean, a man who brags about being an example of Jesus Christ to his people and then turns around and takes a family that everyone in his church loved and publicly grinds them into the ground. That man is demonstrated to be exactly what he is. He's not a shepherd. I heard a story a long time ago about the shepherd who had to bring his sheep to, you know, they bring them to their final place of execution, right? And he gave them over to the man and he walked away and there was people looking at and the, the man that was, was behind the sheep with a stick, move, 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 move
And the people said, look at that shepherd, how he's handling those sheep. And the man said, oh, that's not the shepherd. He's the butcher. You find out that that shepherd is not really a shepherd. He's a butcher masquerading as a shepherd. For a man to be cruel to people who served in his church for over 16 years is the sign of an extremely insecure man. And he now realizes that what he taught them over the years is not standing the test of fire. His teachings are being brought into question. So what does an insecure man do? He turns into attack mode. And that is totally contrary to what a man of God should do. And then for the past three weeks, the past three weeks, and I know, because I've been watching every one of his sermons which end up on YouTube. I've been watching. And in his pulpit, he has done nothing but attack them. Not by name, but every person in that place knows who he's talking about. And then to convince the rest of the people that are there not to try the same thing, he's scaring them. And he says things that are not true about them and not true about why they left. They left because they no longer agree with what he's teaching and with mixing law and grace. And I'll be honest with you, that's just way beyond his ability to understand right now because until now, he's, he has always thought that every time you open this book, no matter where you open your King James Bible, it's all written to the body of Christ. Here's a man who on the phone told me that he had never heard what I was teaching. He never heard dispensational truth. And for the past three weeks has become an expert on hyper-dispensationalism. And he has said the most ignorant, untrue things that I've ever heard in, 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 my, in, my, long li in my life. Because we're not hyper-dispensationalists. He doesn't know what we are. When you can't rebuttal the truth, you know what you do? You lie about it. You build a straw man, and then you attra attack that straw man and the people in your assembly who don't know any better. They're all yelling, amen, amen, in total ignorance. And I can tell you that as I'm listening to him, he's using language that he's never used in his life. He's talking about our church rightly divides. We're living in the dispensation of grace. He's never said that in his life. He's never used those words. He never uttered those words. But now these words are finally coming out of his mouth in the past three weeks because he has to make it look like he's been talking about these things all along. We've always taught these things. Yeah, right. One night he began his message. He began his message by saying, you know that in our articles of faith, we teach that, we say that salvation is by grace. Isn't it sad that he had to point to his articles of faith to prove that they teach salvation is by grace? Now, listen, I thought that was very telling. Folks, where do I point to when I tell you that salvation is by grace? I got a 300-year-old King James Bible on my pulpit every time I'm here. You know why? That's to let you know this book is the same as that one you have in your lap. It hasn't changed. Amen? That's why, this book, th that's why I keep that here every Sunday. Every time we're in this pulpit, this book. God's final authority. Isn't it sad that a man elevates the articles of faith, the articles of doctrines of his church over a King James Bible? Is that sad or what? When we were on the phone, I asked him when he thought the church, the body of Christ, began. 
He believes that the church started in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, when Jesus Christ said, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Naturally, I explained to him that that wasn't the case. He told his people that I was trying to force his thinking. He goes like this. <laughs> that man, he talked about me like that. I'm, he talked about our conversation on the phone. I'm listening to this guy. I'm like, hmm. He forgot to tell his people that in the previous chapter, Jesus Christ had told his disciples to not go into the way of the Gentiles and into any of the city, city of the Samaritans. Enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Everyone in this church knows that the body of Christ is made up of Jews and Gentiles. So how could the body of Christ exist if there were no Gentiles? The body of Christ is made up of Jews and Gentiles, folks. That's why the apostle said there's no difference between Jews and Gentiles, because they were now fellowshipping in the same body, which was the strangest thing in the whole universe to ever have happened. I hate to say it, but that is some sloppy Bible exposition. To say that the church, the body of Christ, started in Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. One night he was telling his people that the church didn't start with Paul. It started with Peter. And he quoted this verse, Acts 10, 34. Then Peter opened his mouth and said, Of a truth I perceive that God is no respecter of persons, but in every nation he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. His people unanimously shouted, Amen, not realizing that he was putting them under a works-oriented salvation. And they shouted amen. Look at these words. But in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. When someone doesn't believe that the word of God must be rightly divided, and they think that everything in the Bible is written to the body of Christ, and they don't ask what the prevailing conditions were when these words were written, who's being written to, who's being spoken to, what is being taught. And when they don't understand that Paul is the apostle to the body of Christ who said, I speak to you Gentiles, they will take a verse like this without thinking about the ramifications of it without thinking of how they're mixing law and grace and put their people under the law and then they create more confusion than they ever thought possible. Peter says that in every nation, he that feareth him and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. Is that what our Apostle Paul said when he spoke to the body of Christ? No, this is what Paul said. To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. How? In whom we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. Let me put these two verses on the board. Ephesians 1.6 and Acts 10.35. One verse says, To the praise of the glory of His grace, wherein He hath made us accepted in the Beloved. He made us accepted in the beloved in Christ. Peter said, you work, righteous, you work righteousness, you'll be accepted of him. For a man to preach and not realize that these two verses are completely different and that Paul is preaching Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, listen folks, when a man doesn't understand the difference between ex being accepted in the beloved because of the redemption that we have through the blood of Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace, when he doesn't understand that that is different than being accepted because you do works of righteousness, I'm sorry, he's not qualified to be in a pulpit preaching during the dispensation of grace. This is the man who called me a heretic and called his people that left a heretic. And he doesn't know the simple difference between these. It's 
See, the reason that a man can preach about Acts 10.35 like that is because he doesn't understand who Cornelius was. One thing that I did not understand as a Baptist preacher was the promise that God gave to Abraham. You remember that. It's Genesis chapter 12, verses 1, and 1 to 3 there. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Notice, and I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. Remember the, 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 the centurion who had a servant who was sick? He was a Gentile. And he asked, the, the disciples asked your master to come heal him. And the Lord said, I don't even have to go, he's healed. And they, they were saying, oh, no, 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 he's not going to do that. And then they, and the centurion was saying, no, he's not going to do that. And then they were saying, but he had built us, he built us a synagogue. He built them a synagogue. That's Luke chapter 7. Right? I will bless them that bless thee. That centurion, that Gentile in the Gospels was blessed because he had blessed Israel. And his servant was healed. You remember that? That's Luke chapter 7. This verse right here, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. I will That's why Peter was sent to the house of Cornelius. Notice Acts 10.1. There was a certain man in Caesarea called Cornelius, a centurion of the band called the Italian band, a devout man, one that feared God with all his house, who gave much alms to the people. That's much alms to Israel. He gave much alms, not just some. He blessed Israel. So what's God going to do? I'm going to bless them that bless me. And Cornelius is a type of a Gentile being saved in the tribulation period. One thing I did not understand when I was a denominational preacher was Matthew chapter 25, where the Lord is talking about, if you give a cup of cold water to this one, or you go visit that one in prison, you've done it unto me. That's the tribulation period. That's how Gentiles are saved in the, in the, in the tribulation period, by blessing Israel. There's no salvation by grace after the church is gone out of here. That message goes with us. And then you're back under the law. Faith and works in the tribulation period. That's how it's going to be. So Peter knew. Peter knew. He's not supposed to go to the Gentiles. Jesus Christ had told them, go not into the way of the Gentiles, into any city of the Samaritans, enter ye not. But when he gets that vision of that sheet coming down and it represents the Gentiles, listen, you need to understand that Peter didn't even know what had happened to Saul of Tarsus yet. He didn't know about the Damascus Road experience. He didn't know God had raised up a man that now he's going to send to the Gentile. He didn't know that. So what does Peter do when he gets the vision of the sheep? He says, no way. No way. Acts 10, 14, Peter said, no, no, Lord, not so. I've never eaten anything that is common or unclean. I'm not going near Gentiles. Acts 10, 15, and the voice spake unto him again the second time, what God hath cleansed, that call not thou common. But Peter must have been sitting there shaking his head like, no way, no way. Okay, This was done thrice, <laughs> three times. How many times did Peter deny the Lord? Maybe Peter was the kind of guy who needed three admonitions, you know what I'm saying? He needed to be told three times before he understood something. So Peter gets a threefold confirmation here that he's going to the Gentiles, but not to preach the gospel of the grace of God and salvation by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ and forgiveness of sins through the blood of Christ and the eternal salvation of those believers. No, he, he doesn't, Peter does not know anything about salvation by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Do you remember the first words Peter preached when he arrived at the house of Cornelius? 
He said, and he said unto them, ye know how that it is an unlawful thing for a man that is a Jew to keep company or come unto one of another nation. Man, I'm not even supposed to be here, is what Peter's saying. But God hath showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And when he finally begins preaching to them, he does not say, for by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourself. He doesn't say, Titus 3, 5, not by works of righteousness which ye have done, but according to his mercy he saved you. He doesn't say, Romans 5, 1, therefore being justified by faith, you have peace with God. No, he says, but in every nation, he that feareth God and worketh righteousness is accepted with him. That is not the salvation of, gospel, of the gospel of the grace of God. This is a salvation of works. It's, you know, I can't cover this whole narrative and keep going in Acts chapter 10 because we'll be here for a long time. I've covered this many times, but I will tell you that as a Baptist preacher, it was almost impossible for me to understand that these people had not become members of the body of Christ. I couldn't comprehend that. I just couldn't do it. Because I, I didn't know anything about Luke 12, 32. Fear not, little flock, for it is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. See, this is not taught in a Baptist church. I never taught that as a Baptist preacher. These are people who would believe that Jesus Christ was the Messiah of Israel, the little flock people. Right? And they became part of that. They're the ones who were gathered in the upper room at Pentecost. The word church is used about those people. And when I was a Baptist, the word church meant the body of Christ. Till I read, till I read Acts 7.38 where he talked about Moses and the church in the wilderness. And I, wait, wait, wait. The church in the wilderness is not the body of Christ. So every time you see the word church in the Bible, it's not talking about the body of Christ. It's talking about a called out group. These little flock people were called out of wicked, reprobate, uh, destitute of the truth Israel. And they became this little flock. And their inheritance is the earth in the millennial kingdom. I never, could, I never understood that until I started rightly dividing the word of truth. I'd love to continue along this line of thinking, but I have to move on. See, the man who preaches law and grace is the man who's calling me a heretic and the people who left his church a heretic. Here's how you will always recognize a heretic. He's always mixing law and grace. Okay, that's the true heretics. And here's what happens when his people hear someone bring clear distinctions like this into their ears and, re and they realize that their pastor doesn't know the differences and their eyes are opened to this clear, distinct difference between law and grace. And you know what happens to those people who hear this truth? They want to get out of Dodge. They say to their spouses, I can't go back there. That's what happens when people hear the truth of the Word of God. And the reason that happens is because truth is more powerful than false teaching. Later on, he was telling his sheep, and I'm, I'm using the word sheep and shepherd intentionally, because you and I know you're not sheep and I'm not your shepherd. You are the body of Christ. And Jesus Christ is the resurrected, glorified head of his people today. We're not sheep. Sheep belong to Israel. Shepherds belong to Israel. Jesus Christ is your head. And you're in Christ. And I'm just a helper of your joy. And that's it. That's all I am. That's all any pastor is supposed to be today, is a helper of your joy and helping you understand and know who you are in Christ. 
that man says, oh, I, you know, we teach people to keep living in sin. Excuse me. Excuse me. <laughs> no, I will tell you, you're not perfect. I'm not giving you a license to go out and live in sin because you're saying that. I don't follow you home to see what you're doing. I don't have that. I'm not omniscient. I can't be in all your houses at the same time. I don't have electronic flies that I can send and park them on the wall with a, with a camera on your house and watch what you're doing so I can preach in the pulpit on, on Sunday night that how terrible you are. That's not my job. Man, if you don't know you're not supposed to sin, uh, excuse me. You know, uh, I don't know. Because you believe you're safe forever, all, all of a sudden you've got a license to sin? No. You know, we teach, for the grace of God that bringeth, to, that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men, teaching us to deny ungodliness, unworldliness, and all the ungodly lusts and everything. Okay? So, but you know that when I say sheep and shepherds, I'm not talking, I'm saying that like, hypothetically, because that's what he calls himself, a shepherd, and he calls his people sheep. I'm not, I'm not, okay. They're members of the body of Christ, and Jesus Christ is also their resurrected, glorified head, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Okay? He doesn't know what his place is in the body of Christ. And then he said, you can always recognize false teachers because they always teach from other sources. And then he talked about the Jehovah's Witness who have Charles Taze Russell. And he talked about the Mormons who have Joseph Smith. And he talked about the Muslims who have Muhammad. And he talked about the Catholics who have Luther. And then, and then I knew where he was going. And I knew what he was about to say. And then he said, and then he said well, since Wednesday night we talked about hyper-dispensationalism, let me talk about that a little. He's always there now. He's always attacking this, this thing called dispensational truth. And then he talks about hyper-dispensationalism, and then he mentions Bullinger and Darby, John Nelson Darby and E.W. Bullinger. Now, I was surprised that he mentioned Darby, because Darby is an Acts 2 dispensationalist just like he is. Darby teaches the same exact things that man teaches. So he's got some confusion in his mind. E.W. Bullinger is a hyper-dispensationalist. We wholeheartedly reject the teachings of E.W. Bullinger. Well, I don't, you, some of you, I mean, I don't even talk about him, but that is not a man that taught me anything about the Scripture, the Word of God. Okay? And I'm not going to try to explain to you what a hyper-dispensationalist is right this second, but we ain't it. We're not it. You know, we just understand Paul is our apostle. Okay, that's, 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 that's really a big difference between where I was and where, where I am now. But here's a man who mentions all these cults, and he says that they all get their teachings from other sources, and that makes them heretics. Yet for years and years and years, this man has been preaching in his pulpit how that everything he learned, he learned from his pastor, and that there's nothing that he will ever change about what he learned from his pastor and how they came from Anabaptists, and Anabaptist means we reject everyone else's water baptism because Anabaptist means rebaptizers. And we got that from John the Baptist. And here's the most important thing his pastor, nor this pastor that I'm talking about, has ever questioned where did John the Baptist get his instructions to baptize people in the Jordan River? So listen, this man and his pastor and the pastor before that, they teach that water baptism is your membership into the local New Testament church. 
Do you know that there is not a verse in the entirety of the Word of God that says that water baptism puts you into a local church? But he is absolutely, totally enamored with this. I mean, he gets angry about this. I mean, these people that I'm talking about, they have a brother. She has a brother who's very, very sick, and he's overweight, and he has a hole in his stomach, and he's in the hospital, and he's on the verge of dying. And this pastor goes there to see him, and all he wants to do is figure out a way to get him water baptized. That's all he wants to do. We're gonna fit, we're gonna, we've got men who can take you, and we're going to put you in a tub of water. And this poor man, he can't move. He's dying. All he wanted was confirmation that his faith in Christ was sufficient to get him to heaven. And do you know that that pastor never gave him that? He needed to be baptized in water. I can tell you that John the Baptist was not baptizing people to baptize them into the local church because the body of Christ did not exist when John the Baptist broke the 400 years of silence and called Israel to repentance. And the, the Jews and Gentiles in one body did not exist then. And because they don't know why John the Baptist was baptizing, they've used a doctrine that belongs to Israel and imposed it on the body of Christ. And they don't know that God told Israel in Exodus chapter 19 that they would become a kingdom of priests. And John the Baptist, you want to say something? I have a question. What did they do with the thief on the cross? Yeah, the thief on the cross. I was going to mention that too. The thief on the cross didn't get baptized either. Yeah, I know. I know. Water baptism has nothing to do with salvation and it has nothing to do with being part of a local assembly and it has nothing to do with any of that. It was, it was for Israel's program. I have three messages on water baptism. Three. That explain where it came from, what it was for, what it accomplished, why Paul was baptized. He was baptized because the only program that existed when he was arrested on the road to Damascus was those kingdom saints. And they took him and said, well, got to do what we did and they baptized him. But later on, when Paul learned the revelation of the mystery, he, he preached, Christ sent me not to baptize, but to preach the gospel. Yeah, yeah. That's progressive revelation in the word of God. But the first thing that a priest did in Exodus chapter 29, before he was inducted into his office, was he was washed with water. That's, the very first, that's why John the Baptist came baptizing them because they had been promised they were going to become a kingdom of priests. But he came unto his own, and his own received him not, and they rejected him, and their program was rejected, and God introduced the dispensation of grace, as we know it today. But he never knew this. Now, though, he's going to try to incorporate this teaching because he realizes that he's going to have to do some backpedaling, no pun intended, to make his sheep under, believe that he always understood that, and he's going to find some way of incorporating the, the, the priesthood. Oh, the, now the church, the body of Christ, we're not a priesthood, okay? We're members of the body of Christ in the dispensation of grace. As if dunking someone in a tub of fluoridated tap water is going to grant them membership into a local church. It doesn't make sense. To be frank with you, that is total heresy. Total heresy. And where did he learn that? Not from the word of God. He learned that from a man, which he says is a sign of being a heretic. Remember, he should, this is a sign of being a heretic. They always teach from other sources. And he's teaching from what his pastor taught him. Very interesting, isn't it? I'm going to close with this today. That poor man doesn't know the difference between the gospel of the kingdom, the gospel of the circumcision, the gospel of the grace of God, and the everlasting gospel. He doesn't know. He laughed and he ridiculed 
and he mocked, rightly dividing the word of truth from his pulpit. And here's the sad part. He told his people that we reject all New Testament epistles. <laughs> I mean, and his people believed it. You know, he's, and, and, then he sa and then he said, and, and he teaches, me, that James and 1st and 2nd John and 1st and 2nd Peter wasn't written to the church. Well, in the background, his people are saying amen, but here's the sad part. He did not tell them where James says he's writing to the body of Christ. He didn't tell them that. Because from what I can tell, he doesn't care. He doesn't care about that. As far as he's concerned, if it's in the Bible, if it's anywhere in the Word of God, it belongs to the body of Christ. It's written to the body of Christ. That's his attitude about the King James Bible. Law or grace, who cares? I don't care. I'll make it fit into your life somehow, is his attitude. So he doesn't tell them where James said that James is writing to the body of Christ. That's not a problem for his sheep because they don't need any biblical evidence for anything. As long as he says it from the pulpit, they're going to say amen because they're following a man. They don't care about what the Bible says. See, here's the thing. I did not say, I didn't say that James is not writing to the body of Christ. James says he's not writing to the body of Christ. He says that. I didn't say it. Where does he say that? James chapter 1, verse 1. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who? To the 12 tribes. Who's James writing to? The 12 tribes scattered abroad. He's not writing to you. Oh, pastor, are we the 12 scribes, the 12 tribes scattered abroad? You know what he'll say? Don't worry about that. The whole Bible's written to you. Oh, okay, pastor. If you say so. Then later on, he finds out that what the people say while they're in the pew really doesn't matter. It's what they say as they, they're pulling out of the parking lot that really matters. Because people today aren't ignorant anymore. People today have Google. And when their pastor's talking about hyper-dispensationalism and rightly dividing the word of truth and the dispensation of grace, guess what? They're going to go home and they're going to Google that. And when they Google that, you know what's going to happen? See, we have a man, so you don't know about this. We have a man who has just taken on a project for our assembly where he's paying an SEO company, which is a search engine optimization company, to put our name at the top of every search engine. And when people search those words, guess who's going to show up? Yours truly. His work, worst nightmare. He should have listened to those people who said, we want to leave quietly. Please respect us. Please respect our request. I read, I read the thing myself. It was so beautiful. Any pastor would have said, you know, these people are doing the right thing. They just want to leave quietly. And then, had he let them leave, the people would have said, where's, where's, where's so-and-so? I almost said their names. I don't want to do that. Where's so-and-so? Well, they're having a spiritual issue in their life. Just keep them in prayer. And he could have gone on with his ministry. No, what does he do? He turns it into an attack thing for weeks, for weeks. It's all he's been talking about in his pulpit for the past three weeks. Let me tell you something real quick, okay? Let me tell you how YouTube works. YouTube has algorithms. Now, what those algorithms do, and I know this by experience because one time I had preached a message, and a lot of people had said it's a great message, great me So you know what I did? I tried to re-upload it and title it a different title like three weeks later so that even more people could see it because it was a salvation message, right? 
As soon as I uploaded it, it wasn't but a few minutes, I got a thing from YouTube, you've already uploaded that message. You can't do it twice. Algorithms. In a second, the computer re reads that and says, whoa, you've already done that. If you change a few words in it, like if I cut a little clip out of the middle and, just, and then put it back to, and upload that, then it, it'll let it go because the algorithm is looking for identicality. But what it's also looking for are words. Words that people are using in different places and then it wants to put their videos together. That's why you got all those videos that show up on the side. They want to put those videos. Why? Because they're interested in advertising. They want to advertise. So they're going to, so as he's using all these words, guess what I put in my tags? All those words. So guess what's going to happen? All my videos are going to show up next to his videos. His worst nightmare. He should have listened to what his poor people said. We want to leave quietly. Please let us leave quietly. In his last sermon on Wednesday night, he made a big deal of how we say that the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews. And we're not, we're Gentiles. We're not Hebrews. He said that in his pulpit. And he told his people, if you believe that, you're going to start sinning. And when you start sinning, God is going to flip your life around. Fear tactics. Now, let me ask you this. Now, yeah, right. But let me ask you this. How does understanding that the book of Hebrews was written to the Hebrews after the rapture of the church as they go into the tribulation period. How will that make people start sinning? I mean, think about this. Our apostle, our apostle in Philippians chapter 1 verse 6 said, being confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. That's talking about the eternal salvation you have until the rapture of the church. That's security. Are, you, are we waiting for judgment? No, you're not waiting. You're not going to be judged. You're not going to be, your sins were judged at the cross. Your sins cannot be judged again. Amen? Okay, we're not looking, we're not looking for, gen, for, for judgment as a member of the body of Christ. But those people in the book of Hebrews, for if we sin willfully, after that we've received the knowledge of the truth, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sins. How could that be written to the body of Christ? I mean, look, let's face it. None of us are perfect. We all have infirmities in our flesh, one way or another. Something we, there's something that we always regret. Just by nature, that's how we are. We're, Adam, we're Adam's fallen children. So when we sin, according to this, there's no more sacrifice for you. You know what that means? You're doomed. You're doomed. That is not saying this. That's not saying this. Okay? There remaineth no more sacrifice, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. He that despised Moses' law died without mercy under two... Have you ever despised Moses' law? First of all, you were never under Moses' law. God didn't give the law to Gentiles. He gave the law to Israel. Who's he talking to? Hebrews. Yeah, now, that fits perfectly. Why would you try to make this fit in the body of Christ and twist it out of its context in the Word? of? Why not just leave it there and say, look, folks, this is written to people going through the tribulation period where their salvation is by faith and works and how beautiful that just fits and you don't have to twist everything and people just go, yeah, pastor, that makes perfect sense. Why do you fight against the Word of God? The deeper he goes down that rabbit hole, the tighter that noose around his neck gets. He's fighting against God. He's fighting against the clear, plain teaching of the Word of God. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall he be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. 
That's totally different than what we're told by our apostle that we can be confident of this very thing, that he which hath begun a good work in you will perform it until the day. Paul said in Romans 8, For I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come nor height nor depth nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's not what that's saying. That's not what that's saying. Isn't it just easier to just agree with the Word of God? Listen, I'm closing, seriously. There's a verse in John. Before, when I was first saved, I remember this. It's John 7, 17. It says, if any man will do his will, he shall know of the doctrine, whether it be of God or whether I speak of myself. Listen, this is God's timeline. I didn't create this. This is Genesis to Malachi, 400 years of silence. John the Baptist breaks the silence. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Romans 15, 8 tells us that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision to confirm the promises made unto the fathers. On the cross, he gave them a one-year extension of mercy. Romans chapter 11, 11, Paul says, I say then, have they stumbled? They stumbled at the cross. Have they stumbled that they should fall? God forbid, but through their fall, salvation is coming to the Gentiles. And now Paul writes, who says, I speak to you Gentiles. And Paul writes Romans to Philemon. This is the dispensation of grace. It will end with the rapture of the church. Then there's Daniel's 70th week, the time of Daniel's trouble, the, the Jacob's trouble. Jesus Christ returns at the end of this, destroys the armies of the Antichrist, sets up his millennial kingdom, then out into eternity. You know what that's called? Rightly dividing the word of truth. That's called rightly dividing the word of truth. It's all truth from Genesis to Revelation. It's all truth, but it's not all your truth. There's truth here that belongs to Israel under the law. There's truth that belongs to the body of Christ. Romans to Philemon, written by the apostle who said, I speak to you Gentiles. Then there's truth after the rapture, Hebrews to Revelation, for those people going into Daniel's 70th week, then out into the millennial. It's all truth, but it's not all your truth. We rightly divide their truth from our truth and our truth from their truth so that we don't create confusion in our minds by trying to mix this with this and reach back there and mix that with that. That's rightly dividing the word of truth. And I really am closing with this, but he closed his last message by saying that we never reach out to the lost. We don't do anything. We only go into churches and try to steal people. That's what he said. Well, I'm just going to do this real quick. This is for the lost. This is God. He gave the commandments. Everybody that's born into this world is born under the commandment. And the commandments say, The soul that sinneth, it shall die. God shall by no means clear the guilty. And that's every single one of us. And one day we heard that Jesus Christ died for us that he was buried, he was raised again from the dead, and then we heard that verse, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And when you believe that, God stopped looking at you this way. He stopped looking at you through the law, and he started looking at you through the cross of Jesus Christ, and he sees you in Christ. He no longer sees you, he sees Jesus Christ. If you sin, which we all do every once in a while, right? If you sin, he sees the blood of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And rather than death, now you have eternal life. And rather than going to hell, now your destination is heaven. Ladies and gentlemen, that's Paul's gospel. That's the gospel of salvation by grace through faith in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And we trust that for the forgiveness of our sins. He told his people, I'm not saved. That's what he told his people, to discredit me because some people left his church to join this ministry. I don't know why a man would do that, but he does it to justify his own teachings. But I'm telling you that the further he goes down that rabbit hole 
against the Word of God, rightly divided, the tighter the noose is getting around his neck. And his people, who are not stupid, they're going to hear this. They're going to hear this message today. And they're going to know, I don't think our pastor is telling us the truth. Now, what I'm saying could apply to a thousand different churches this morning. Everybody online, everybody that's joining us online, we have over 11,000 people on YouTube. We have almost 3,000 on Facebook. Every single one of them has left a law-keeping, mixing law with grace church because of the truth of who they are now in Christ. They understand. They understand because there's so much confusion when a man is sticking people under the book of Hebrews. Amen? So if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, and I'm talking to you online, if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Savior, today is the day of salvation. This is the day when you can be saved by grace without trying to do anything to please God, without trying to earn it, without trying to pay for it. You don't deserve it. It's a free gift that He gives you by simply believing that Jesus Christ died for you. And He paid the penalty for your sin, but you have to receive that forgiveness. And you receive that forgiveness by faith. And therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God and you'll have peace with God if you believe that simple message. Amen? Let's pray. Our gracious God and our Father, so thankful this morning that we could bring forth the Word of God and the clarity of why we don't mix law and grace. And I pray for that pastor, Lord. I pray that that pastor will come to his senses and he'll see that he needs to change what he's been teaching and teach his people the truth of the Word of God. And I pray these things in that name that is above every name, the name of our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I was going to sing a song today, just as I am, but we've been here a long time now. So, folks online, thank you for joining us today. Remember, you are blessed with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places. There's nothing else. Amen? There's nothing else. So we'll see you Thursday night. Take care. <laughs>